Hello everybody, this is Abuichi Beauty. Today we're going to be continuing with Imaginary. Um, right now we left off that chapter 2 of Imaginary. So without further ado, I don't want to I don't want to say too much um, in this intro, so let's get right into chapter 2 of Imaginary. Chapter 2 Evacuation is underway. Finally the book pointed directly to the southeast, which where we left off after I bought that uh, after I redownloaded that compass app. Michael stormed through the brushwood and suddenly stopped in his tracks blinded by the sunlight. What? stammered Michael. It was just night time. In front of his eyes and A's imagination was a sun drenched footpath running straight through the forest. Michael hesitated for a moment but remembering the hair raising glare of the stranger who was left behind on the green he quickly picked himself up and stepped onto the footpath. In broad daylight, the sense of alarm seemed to appear, while the tall pines that bordered the footpath gave off a calming aroma. Michael even felt a tinge of excitement and decided that sooner or later, the footpath would lead him to people and help. The only problem was walking barefoot because the ground often got rocky and the footpath went up and down. Michael guessed that he was somewhere in the mountains. A while later, the pines gave way to stout oak trees. Looking at them, Michael once again began to worry because their thick trunks were pierced with road signs. It looked as through, as though the trees consumed the signs as they grew. Michael stopped to examine one of the signs and read Anzo, Sector 6. Anzo. That word looked familiar, he thought, realizing a moment later that he had seen it flashing above the map on the medallion. He also remembered that he had come across that name in the book about Jeremy. He tried to recall anything he could about this place, but it was all but all was in vain. He had read less than a quarter of the book before deciding somebody was having a joke and abandoning abandoning the reading. Still, there were a couple of things that he remembered clearly. First, this wasn't the earth. Second, it was full of strangeness, and that was clear to him, as he still couldn't shake off the weird sensation of the abrupt transition from night to day. At this moment he was distracted from his thoughts by some usual looking tree leaves. Their fibers were golden and ran through its green surface in a broken line. You might think it was a computer microchip rather than a leaf. Michael stroked its surface in wonder, but the leaf felt like the real thing. Suddenly, Michael and A heard a female voice. It was barely audible and trailed off every so often. Full of hope, Michael rushed in its direction. The sound gradually became clearer. Wow, okay. Wait. Right, let's see what it reads. Let's see what it reads. Right, attention, attention. Due to the increased anomaly level in Sector 6, all research and military groups presented as Enzo should leave immediately. Rescue robots have been dispatched to assist with the evacuation. When Michael turned another corner, he saw a small meadow and the source of a voice. A rusty military pickup, overgrown with vegetation, stood in the center of a meadow. A loudspeaker stuck out on top, broadcasting the sounds that Michael had heard in the forest. The pickup was surrounded by wooden boxes with parachutes still attached. They had clearly been dropped from the air, and they looked much newer than the car. The boxes were broken and surrounded by pamphlets that had spilled them, spilled out from them. Michael picked up one of the brochures. It said. Relevant information for all detachments lost in the anomaly zone, Anzo, which is Anzo, yeah. The pamphlet has two spreads. The first of them showed the map of Anzo, which matched the one he had seen on the medallion, although this one was done in greater detail. Anzo looked like a circle divided into six concentric rings. The outer ring was marked Sector 6. The dot in the very center was marked Epicenter. It was the dot that had flashed on the medallion, the one that Michael had to reach. The map had other labels as well, such as object number C5, Silico Meadow, or object number D8, Recursive C. The other spread showed some photographs and contained short descriptions of Anzo's known dangers. As Michael examined the very first photograph with a strange creature that looked like a furry meatball suspended in the air, he heard a loud noise behind his back. He turned around and saw some rusty thing riding out of the forest. 
and moved on t tracks and had a humanoid body frame equipped with arms that ended in claws and something resembling a head. The head figure said, Sir, evacuation is underway. Please follow my instructions. The robot moved towards Michael, who let out a sigh of relief, thinking that this was his chance to reach civilization and get back home instead of dancing to the medallion's tune. I'm so happy to see you. Can you take me to the humans? Michael's voice was full of hope. Sir, evacuation is underway. Please follow my instructions. The robot repeated in a clanking voice, and something resembling a syringe popped out of its body frame. Michael suddenly had a funny feeling about this and glanced at the pamphlet spread. The very same robot looked back at him from one of the faded photographs. Catching under the photo read, Rescue Robots. Dropped a year ago to help those remaining at Anzo due to, the, due to the effects of anomaly. No longer obey the original algorithm. Avoid contact by any means. Deadly. Alright, before I continue, I want to say that animation of with that that robot is just like it's just how like the 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 letters the letters can be like can form into this kind of art. It's very unique. In this, I I love it. Sir, so evacuation to robot began again, but Michael was already running at full speed. We saw additional rusty bodies appear seemingly out of nowhere. Some were coming down the withered tree trunks, while others were creeping out from other layer of dried up leaves. The rusty claws were seriously stretched out for Michael from everywhere. And this whole heap of junk was creaking, humming, and wheezing, repeating the same phrase over and over. They didn't accelerate, but moved at a steady, yet rather steady pace. It was quick enough that Michael, who for a long time had been spending five days a week in an office chair, knew that sooner or later he would wear himself out. He was running and trying to figure out what he had done wrong to make the book drop him into his unfriendly world. Look at that, look at the sound. That word, that margin to symbolize that he's running. Alright, I wonder if Jeremy worked it out. A thought ran through his mind. In the next moment, another thought hit him. Could all of this be happening because I stopped reading about it? This thought forced the already worn out Michael to lose all the remaining colors in the sheets. And without stopping, he loudly yelled to the medallion, Hey, just don't stop reading about me, even if you think that this is all some sort of joke. I'm not. Not that it brought him any comfort because he didn't know whether A had actually heard his yell or he had stopped reading the whole time. A didn't hear him, but he had no way of reacting. He saw that the crowd of humans behind Michael's back was getting bigger. The whole forest, as far as the eye could see, was filled with the rusty body frames of a whole army of robots. Alright, before I continue, I want to clarify that A is me, a bootleg tribute. But yeah. Michael ran out into a clearing and came to a dead stop. Just before he almost fell, right in front of him was a sheer drop while the footpath turned left and ran down. Wow, look at that animation. Look at that animation with the, the words. Wow, and the, the letters are stuck on top of the words. I mean, I love it. I'm impressed. All right, and ran down a slightly less steep slope. Dragging his feet, Michael began his descent, but in just a few short steps, he stumbled and rolled head over heels toward the bottom. He kept rowing until he came to a halt smack in the middle of a very thick fog. He felt his remaining strength slipping away. His whole body ached after the fall. But the hum of robots behind his back forced Michael to get up on all fours and began to crawl. It was unclear where, though, as there was no footpath under his feet, and he could barely see his own hands through the fog. At first, Michael tried to crawl in a way that would leave the hum of robots behind his back, but soon the sound started coming from all sides when a pair of tracks clanged right in front of his nose. Michael realized that he had completely lost his sense of direction. Panicking, he began moving chaotically, trying to maneuver between the robots and losing his breath, yelled into medallion, Hey, if you are still reading this, help, I'm begging you, think of something. It was still reading and had just turned a page. He noticed that with each turn, Michael's remaining time was running out. He had no connection to the real time and A's were but attendant on the turns of the page. Each additional flick increased the risk of Michael's failure. 
Right now, Michael couldn't move blindly in such thick fog without running into the robots. Had to devise a way to disperse the fog. <sighs> do I have to? I don't know how to do this. Like, what do I gotta do? Do I just like, <sighs> or maybe <sighs> yell into the microphone? I'm not sure. Sorry, um, if that was kind of loud. Yeah, I I'm gonna like add a like a disclaimer for it. There's some loud parts. I don't know what to do here. Um, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do. Alright, he continued to turn the pages while Michael on the other hand stopped moving altogether as he found a spine-chilling dissonance. It was as if he was crawling but also staying just where he was. He only saw the mon monotonous white while the air was so stuffy that even when moving, Michael couldn't feel the slightest breeze on his body. The air was motionless and the fog had no intention of despairing. Maybe if I shake... I don't know. I don't know. My guard pretty much resigned himself to the idea that Ahad stopped reading about him. He lay there with his eyes open, waiting for the one of the robots to stumble upon him and end the whole thing. Peering into the white fog, he imagined himself inside the cloud, recalling the way he loved watching the flying helicopters when he when he was small. The copters raised a strong wind, and right now he would have given anything to feel even the slightest breeze against his skin. A thought how great it would be if he could only raise some wind in Michael's world and chase the fog away. Time passed. So far, Michael was in luck. If luck was the right word, the robots continued to move past him and only once buzzed by a little too close for comfort. A was still trying to figure out a way to save Michael. In his mind, he heard Michael's breedy, he heavy breathing that stirred a few glass blades on the ground. The breathing continued in A's head as if hitting something. Maybe if... Wait, hold on. Uh, I don't know what to do. Do I just breathe or something? A could see that he was depriving Michael of precious time by turning another page, but nothing came to his mind. He waited for some kind of clue. Suddenly, it seemed as if the fog stirred a little. It was barely noticeable and happening at the moment when his own breath touched the bottom of the book. The place was where the fog was. It was... At as if a puff of air from his world was slight, was able to slightly move the fog in Michael's world. Maybe he could enhance the effect by blowing at the fog from below. Okay, I'll try. There. Well, that, that works. That works. Okay. Thank gosh I found the right one. Wow, look at those clouds above. Wow, I like it. Alright, anyways. The medallion made a hissing sound and the power burst of air escaped from it. The fog began to gradually rise up quickly, condensing and turning into something resembling storm clouds. Very quickly, it started to get dark, but Michael managed to find a footpath and, without waiting another moment for the robots to find their bearings, took off running. A couple of seconds later, the sun completely disappeared behind the clouds, but something continued to light the footpath. When he saw the source of this light, Michael was stunned. Right in front of him stood a small one-story building, illuminated by a sign that read, Waypaw. It had huge glass windows, but old dirt and a tint coating made it impossible to see what was inside. The footpath led directly to the door of the building. For a few seconds, Michael stood there, looking at the building, trying to understand how something like this could appear in the middle of nowhere. But a robot that rode out from around the corner forced him to move. He ran to the door, pushed it, and managed to get in and close the latch before the robot rammed into the door with a thump. Breathing heavily, Michael saw caught sight of his reflection in the door, dirty all over with tousled hair and broken eyeglasses on his nose. He had already forgotten that he was barefoot, wearing nothing but boxers and a t-shirt. Despite the fear and fatigue, his own grotesque appearance brought a smile to Michael's face. He hadn't looked this way since he was a child. This carefree moment was interrupted by the sounds coming from all around him. He turned around and only now managed to examine the dark room full of flickering screens. A was just beginning to realize the nature of this place when he heard Michael's amazed voice. Well, I'll be damned if this isn't an amusement arcade. He was surrounded by arcade machines with Pac-Man, Mario, and the rest of the games he, that he knew from his childhood. But what surprised him even more was the fact that the footpath continued among the arcade machines, running right on top of the carpeting. 
I stopped at a huge old arcade machine which stood at the other end of the room and Michael went to see what was there. On top of the arcade was the image of the medallion that, and the sign that read teleportation. On the screen was a pixelated image of Michael himself. On both sides stood two figures whom he was holding by the hand. The figure to the left resembled a giant conch with eyes. Wait, my YouTube. Wait, hold on. My YouTube, uh, my YouTube logo has a conch with eyes. Would this be coincidence? I don't know. To the right of Michael stood someone whom he didn't recognize, but when A squinted to take a closer look, he discovered that the figure was, in fact, painfully familiar. It was himself pixelated just like Michael, and above this strange trio floated a seagull. Shocked, Michael looked at the arrangement trying to understand what it meant. He pushed one of the buttons and the screen lit up with a message. Hmm. Alright, under- To continue insert her token. Alright. Under the screen, Michael saw a big slot with a signed place token here. He fiddled with the medallion, which was the same size as the slot, and after some hesitation, dropped it inside. The arcade swallowed a token and a new message appeared on the screen. Please pay for the token. Hey, what? Michael hit the arcade with a fist. How am I supposed to pay for it? Is there someone there? He yelled, but received no answer. He started kicking the arcade trying to get the medallion back, but there was no sign of it. He was distracted from this pursuit by a crackling sound from behind. Michael turned around and saw that, the, uh, and saw that on the outside of the building's windows were literally plastered with robots. They leaned heavily on the glass and were stuck trying to force it in and in the middle of this warm this swarm of insane machines stood the creepy man with completely black eyeballs staring, at, staring intently at Michael. There was a deafening cup of Michael felt cool the boss did, turned back in trouble with fright, began to shake the arcade, begging it to return the medallion. This is not the full version. This is not the full version. So I guess I gotta pay for $9.99 to unlock the remaining four chapters of this imaginary. Are you kidding me? Was the first thought that unintentionally crossed A's mind. He certainly wasn't ready for such a twist and even thought about joining Michael and shaking the arcade with all the strength to make it drop the price. Luckily, he could easily just do that. The medallion was inside and just simply shaking the book. This was just the beginning of Michael's story, and if they managed to get out of this predicament alive, there will be new characters to meet and new adventures to experience in mysterious answer. The only thing that separated them from all of this was a piece of metal worth $4.99. That's the light version of Imaginary. Now I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna buy for the full version because I have a lot of uh, games that I haven't even touched, but yeah, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Invite seven more people to continue. A realized this was a back door inside the arcade machine. 
he had a chance to continue reading about Michael without paying for the medallion, but it required some effort. He had to invite seven people to experience Imaginary. To make it happen, he needed to shake the book and share the link to those of his friends who would appreciate Imaginary. One seven of them, one seven of them will install the app. It will be able to continue for free. To keep track of how many left, he could just turn to the previous page or he could still pay for the medallion. I shaked it and it would it let me so I shaked it and it let me so either I pay for five dollars to continue for like four of the chapters either I pay five dollars to continue with the four chapters or I just invite seven more people keep it too long uh thank you guys very much for watching chapter two of imaginary um be sure to subscribe and um maybe i will be um